it's good. 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 It's Good evening. This is Chairwoman Tierra Booker Dwyer. I now call to order the Board of Education of Baltimore County, the meeting of the Board of Education for Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Kayla Drummond. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV. That's Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on, ag on the agenda is consideration of the January 23rd agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters resignations and retirements. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 and D2? So moved from Pong. Do I have a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Dulaski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. Yes. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board member to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols, which are posted in the board room and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that time at the discretion of the board chair. So it is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. Um, we do not have any elected officials 
And so I now call on school system affiliated groups to speak. Our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke with CASE. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Mrs. Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers and members of the board. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of CASE. I serve CASE in three significant ways. One, I am the chief negotiator for CASE member contracts. Two, I represent CASE members when there have been possible violations to their contracts and working conditions. And three, I support CASE members when they have been accused of violating the contract and board policy. My role in representing members is to ensure they get due process. I, I have a question. What is our responsibility as a school community when an employee has been accused of wrongdoing? In recent weeks, a case member has been accused of making racist statements. The statements in question are abhorrent and case denounces them. An investigation is occurring and case is cooperating with BCPS and the authorities. The member and his family have received emails and calls that range from harassment to actual threats of harm. At its core, our legal system is founded on the tenant that you are innocent until proven guilty. Press coverage and social media have made it possible for people to make statements and tell stories with no evidence and no accountability. I am grateful to Dr. Rogers for her letter to the community, asking them to let the investigation happen and to not rush to judgment. I am grateful that Dr. Rogers and her staff coordinated police presence at the member's house when their lives were threatened. I am grateful to the police chief and to the county executive for supporting the investigation. I ask my question again, what is our responsibility as a school community when an employee has been accused of wrongdoing? What is my role as a BCPS leader? What is my role as a board member? What is my role as a staff member, parent, student, or community member? Do I value fairness in search of the truth? Am I willing to stand up and say that? I usually make my comments in person. I didn't feel safe coming in person because I too have received harassing emails. What is our responsibility as a school community when an employee is accused of wrongdoing? We are better than this. Please don't rush to judgment. Please make investigations safe and fair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Burke. And um, Mr. Burke is with the union, so not a school system affiliated group. And I've just been made aware that we do have one school affiliated group member, Dr. Stiff from NWAEAC. Stiff. 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 Stit. Oh, this looks like two Fs. Okay. Um, Dr. Stitt, are you there? I am. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to have a brief statement on behalf of parents, stakeholders, and students in the Pikesville community, which encompasses the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. Good evening and greetings, board members. My name is Dr. LaShawn Stitt, and as the chairperson of the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council, I represent those scholars, families, and stakeholders in the Northwest region of the county while serving as the liaison between the board and the community. I usually say a land acknowledgement because I want to keep my time tight. I will just acknowledge that this is the land of the Susquehannock people and we should always honor and give them gratitude and appreciation for their territory. As a parent, social justice advocate, and scholar, it is not only my passion to push the envelope for equity, but to also raise a voice for the voiceless. Unfortunately, our voices must be used again to raise consciousness concerning the degrading statements made in an audio recording, presumably from the principal at our high school in Pikesville. That circulated last week. Many were in shock, but I wasn't. This is another example of how failing to lead with authenticity and courage has continued to grow and fester in our district. Have you ever seen the film Waiting on Superman? Well, I invite you to view it. There are plenty of lemons throughout this district that create a sour learning and working environment for scholars and staff 
daily. Their behavior has been overlooked or swept under the rug for years, hoping that it would all go away. Well, it is time to take the blinders off and to stop conducting an orchestra of lemons. Take a proactive approach to DEIA as it relates to our respective communities. Commit to the equity training that is offered through the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency right here at BCPS. Create a policy for teachers and administrators to engage in the same training to address existing biases and bigotry that is lurking in our school system. Perhaps this approach will mitigate those situations that pose harm, discomfort, and prejudice to our children. And those that fear retaliation, hopefully they will feel comforted knowing their views and beliefs are supported. The stakeholders of the Northwest region deserve full transparency, demand integrity, and require accountability as we were promised by the superintendent last week with a full investigation. We will not stand to have our intellectual capacity insulted, nor will we allow this behavior to continue in our community. We can't erase history, no matter how much folks want to convince us that America is not a racist country. What we can do is move with respect for our fellow citizens and consciously attempt to shift the trajectory of hate that continues to dwell in our- Thank you, Dr. Stitt. Thank you. Okay, next are our unions, and we have heard from Mr. Burke, so now we will um, go to Ms. Cindy. Sexton of TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Ms. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Ms. Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And thank you to all of you who were able to make it to our legislative breakfast. Back on January 6th, you braved the cold and the snow and the ice, and uh, we had many valuable conversations, not only around legislation, but also the working and learning conditions that are hindering our student and educator successes. Let's please continue those conversations because there is much work to be done. And at that legislative breakfast, our county executive assured us that the agreements and negotiations we completed would be funded so we can turn our attention to something else. Uh, and one of the biggest facing us now is the effective implementation of community schools. I know some of you have met with the Baltimore County Education Justice Coalition, and you may be aware of community school champions that we are working to find at every single community school because it will take more than just the system to get this right, and we are here to do the work together. Together. The possibilities that community schools make available for our students and families are truly life altering and we must be sure we get it right. We look forward to the work with the community school facilitators, community members, student staff and all those in the system who will play a role in this important implementation. It is daunting but it is work that we must get right. Thank you in advance for the collaboration and as always TEPCO stands at the ready to do the work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. Next are the nonprofit community groups, and our first speaker is Aria Kazmina from Team Metal Pipe. Um, good evening to the chair, vice chair, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Ari Kazemnia, and I'm here representing the First Tech Challenge Team 23741. We have spoken at great lengths at past meetings about STEM programs, and they have had such a positive impact on my teammates and I, with most of us coming out of the Cromwell Valley Elementary STEM program. We can stay with full confidence that we would not be here today without, uh, with, we had not been, we would not be here today if we were not enriched at such a young age. And I think it's safe to say that thousands of Baltimore County students across the county and in the workforce would agree. Magnet programs have been a top priority for funding and growth. Not, not only do your constituents see the remarkable impact the, these programs can have, but also the teachers and students on whom you directly leave your mark. The existence of magnet programs, especially that, those that start early and allow students to matriculate, have single-handedly bolstered our students, allowing them to explore careers and interests that would be unavailable otherwise. Any consideration of taking magnet programs out of our students' hands is an affront to the mission of education and the policies that the board has set forth, such as Board Policy 6400. Magnet programs have proven time and time again to produce globally-minded, 
passionate 21st century thinkers with a dedication to serving the broader community. And I would like to believe that this body of devoted public servants would take great pleasure in ushering in a new generation of skilled innovators and great thinkers. Within our magnet programs, you'll find students from all backgrounds. You'll find hopeful, resilient students who have had an illuminating vision for the future. Don't stifle them. Give them the oxygen that they need. Give them the hope that they deserve. Magnet programs, paid CCBC tuition for high schoolers, CTE programs, and countless other opportunities this board has created must be funded, supported, and allocated the resources that they deserve. I trust that you'll make the right decision because I sincerely believe that you are all dedicated to the service of our students above all else. Keep these programs and elevate these programs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zenaria Rowe. Good evening to the chair, vice chair, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Zenaida Rowe, and today I am representing the first tech challenge team number 23741, along with my friend Aria. As a Kenwood High School senior in the International Baccalaureate program, I have felt the impact of magnet programs profoundly in my own life. The IB program is interdisciplinary, globally minded, and rigorous. But with these shining qualities, there is a gem among them that has always stood out to me. The IB program, along with all of the magnet programs in our county, encourages students to explore their interests in an enriching and exciting way. I have experienced this, and it has changed the way that I think and view the world in a overwhelmingly positive way. The IB program has changed my life. It has made me a well-rounded student. Now I am proficient in both the humanities and the STEM fields. I am free to explore my interests and challenge myself. STEM in particular is an area that our students struggle with. These programs embody a rich opportunity to elevate the STEM fields in our system and to create innovative, problem-solving students who could one day change the future. STEM careers are pivotal and high-earning. Doors open up when one is passionate about science, technology, engineering, and math. It is high time we open these doors to our students regardless of their background. STEM programs and magnet programs in general serve as socioeconomic equalizers. As a public school student, I'm conscious of the fact that I am competing with private school students when I apply to colleges. I'm conscious of the fact that I may have less resources than they do and that I may not have the contacts that they do. But it is a great relief to be in a magnet program where I have the chance to be challenged and to enrich myself. And it is really a gem in the public school system that I am so thankful to have and that I hope that future students are able to access as well. My wish is that you keep investing in magnet programs. They could change someone else's life like they have changed mine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Our next speaker is Sonia Busby from Decoding Dyslexia, Baltimore County. Good evening, Dr. Rogers, board members and staff. I am here representing Decoding Dyslexia, Maryland, Baltimore County chapter. We are a parent-led organization that has been advocating for improved identification, instruction, and teacher training in BCPS for more than a decade. We also serve as a support system to BCPS families and staff. I joined Decoding Dyslexia, Maryland when my son was diagnosed with dyslexia by an evaluation that we paid for. When I first asked for help for my son, I was met with excuses. He's a boy, he's a late bloomer, there are kids worse off than him. I mistakenly thought that the outside evaluation results and a diagnosis would lead to an IEP and more importantly, support for him. Instead, I was met with more delay and denied tactics, including misconstruing data by sharing it without grade level benchmarks and having his ELA tests read out loud to him and using inflated grades to further deny him help. He never received a tier three intervention nor an IEP, and after four months, they stopped all interventions, leaving us as parents to fill in the gaps. He is now thriving in a school outside of BCPS that is addressing his needs. 
I am here because this is wrong, because my child's experience is the same as many families. You say consistently that the system is focused on equity. How can it be when parents have to pay for tutoring or move their kids out altogether so they can learn to read? This system's actions on equity do not at all align with your words. Switching gears, I'd like to share her recent account from a struggling BCPS teacher who reached out to us because they also are not being supported as they try to support students. This teacher's IEP team asked the Office of Special Ed to provide a teacher with training on visualizing and verbalizing the only elementary tier three intervention for reading comprehension. The teacher pointed out there is no one currently trained in the building for VNV. And the response from OSE was that they are not currently training anyone in this tier three intervention and instead handed the team teacher paid teacher materials to use. This is not how a tier three intervention is supposed to be implemented ever. Per the elementary ELA tiers of support graphic, BCPS has three programs for tier three ELA, visualizing and verbalizing, Wilson reading system, and Orton Gillingham. According to OSE, you are not training in VNV. Staff stated in the fall that you have no one certified system-wide to teach Wilson, and staff has cut Orton Gillingham training in half by 30 hours. What is happening? These are your most marginalized students. Board members, your questions about curriculum and academic achievement are surface level at best. When are you going to fully engage in ensuring this system is accountable for academic achievement of our students? Thank you. Thank you. Next are our individual citizens and student groups, and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Okay, so we will move on to Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. I have a questions about the budget. If you add them to the questions I raised earlier, I would appreciate your answers. Will this budget have adequate, effective reading and math specialties, specialists? Please show me. Will this budget cut the class size and by how many? Please show me. Will this budget have adequate, effective teachers at all levels so students will graduate ready to face the world. Will this budget have adequate paraeducators at all levels so teachers can effectively improve the students' performance? Will this budget assess any redundancy or ineffective positions in the central area or down? Please show me. Will this budget address the adequacy and effectiveness and accuracy of the curriculum free from bias? Please show me. Will this budget have adequate counselors to effectively address the issues of lack of discipline, behavior, drugs, alcohol, etc. Please show me. So I know I have a minute and 20 seconds left, and I don't want to drag it. I ask you questions. I listen to our esteemed superintendent, and I really have great hope and regards to her. This is not criticism of you, Dr. Rogers. I listened to you when you went around. I listened to you on Monday. I listened to you on Tuesday. I read the budget. And I cannot pinpoint the answers to my previous questions and to these questions. So I have been paying taxes for 48 years. I deserve answers. I do deserve answers. Otherwise, I ask for a rebate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will go back to Ms. Sharon Seroff.
I apologize for being late. I was dropping my child off at work in the city. Um, since you know who I am, I'll try to be brief. Um, when I first moved to Maryland 20 some odd years ago, I was told that the disability that I have, one of many, with auditory processing, was not a real disability because it was not on a list. I don't know where the list came from. I didn't, still don't know if it exists. But this is what I was told. I'm mentioning this because I'm wondering if our budget is taking into consideration what's going on in our county right now. I have watched this year students who have legitimate disabilities like convergence and sufficiency where your eyes don't focus together and you start seeing double or blurry vision. Imagine looking at a page of print with that kind of a disability. Where students who have auditory processing, that's not considered an illegitimate disability anymore. Again, in Baltimore County. Was last year. I had a client tested for it last year. She came up needing, and she's benefiting now from the assistive technology that she got as a result of that evaluation. So I'm wondering, Dr. Rogers, is the idea of we're putting special education first include deciding not to test kids so we don't have to worry about the expense of servicing them? Because that's what's going on. We are literally fighting parents, taking them to court, so that we don't have to test their child for what we consider an illegitimate disability. It's not illegitimate. I wish I could turn it off at a whim, but I can't. And we shouldn't look at disabilities in that manner that we can simply turn them on and off, that grades don't matter in an IEP meeting. They do. Special education is real. And yes, it's expensive, but it's necessary for everyone to have equity in this county. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Since there are speaker spaces available, we will now call from the wait list for individual citizens and student category. The first speaker on the wait list is Eric Morris. Good evening, happy new year, everyone. It's good to see you all again. Uh, my name is Eric Morris. I am a proud BCPS employee, but as you know, I'm not here for that. I'm here because I have, I'm a proud parent of three teenagers in your county, in this county who are students here, and two of which are transgender. Every day in school, I see LGBTQ plus students who are afraid to be themselves in school because of the fear of retribution from other students and families. Sadly, I see it as much in the way staff are treating these LGBTQ students. Why? Because there are hate groups out there that are creating confusion about information and fear when it comes to supporting our LGBTQ plus students. Groups like Moms for Liberty and PASS. Please, I beg you not to listen to these words of hate, lies, and division these groups are spewing. And listen for the words of love, compassion, and equity from groups like the ACLU, NAACP, PFLAG, GLSEN, our own Teachers Union, TABCO, and our very own BCPS Department of Social Emotional Supports. Their mission statement states that BCPS must provide equitable access to impact impactful services and programs that promote students' academic, behavioral, social, emotional, and physical development, 
in preparation for college, career, and life readiness. With this mission statement in mind, I once again ask you, the board, the elected officials, the leaders of BCPS, to reread the BCPS guidelines um, on LGBTQ policy. I shouldn't say policy, it's not yet, hopefully soon. And call for a vote to make those guidelines, district policies, or rules. Or better yet, put together a special committee to plan a new inclusivity policy. A committee made of teachers and staff, administration and parents, and students, and these outside LGBTQ expert organizations to, to put together the best policies to protect our LGBTQ plus children. As I love to quote the Foo Fighters song, Rescued, it states, kings and queens and in-betweens, they all deserve the rights. Let's put these rights in place for our LGBTQ plus students. Thank you for your hard work for all BCPS students. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on the naming of the new Northeast Area Middle School, and our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. I have an idea for you. I hope you like it. So, policy 7520 talks about naming schools per geographic area, street. You could call it Babico School. You could call it, um, I don't know, MedStar School. You could name it after me because my clinic is just nearby. But the policy talks about naming schools in the names of people that has impact on our Maryland history. And as you know, I am born in Texas, so I have to look it up. So I suggest to you to call the school Thomas Stone or Tench Tilgham. I really like that one. Thomas Kennedy, he was in the House of Delegates, and he believed in religious freedom, which I fought for here for 25 years. You could call it Francis Scott Key, of course, that's a famous name, or maybe, maybe Lieutenant Colonel George Armstead. John Hopkins is a good name. George Peabody is a good name. Of course, Frederick Douglass. Everybody knows Frederick Douglass and its impact. Harriet Tubman is one of my favorite. Don't call it John Wilkie's Booth. He's famous, but he is really infamous. So why am I saying this in my last one minute? When you give a school name like Essex, Rosville, uh, whatever, you are really wasting educational occasion. Most students I meet in my profession don't know a thing about American history. As a GD foreigner myself, I know more about American history than many of the people that come my way. And it's really noticeable, you know. So if you call it Babico School, Roseville School, or whatever, you know, there is nothing educational about it. You know, what's the big deal? But if you call it Harriet Tubman, for instance, Peabody, John Hopkins, it means something. And then you can do like you do in Carver. You will have a plate in the front explaining who is that person and what impact that person had on all of us in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policy 3170, Framework for Continuous Improvement. And our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff.
think most of what I wanted to say for this particular item, um, I just said in my public comment, but I will add to it. Um, I think we need to be very specific in our goals and how we're going to implement these goals um, and put it into the policy. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about the policies, especially the ones that I have been in, in contact with and impact students, is that they're very vague. They don't tell parents things that they have to do behind it, like if you disagree with grading, you have to go to a hearing because that's probably the, and hire a lawyer because that's the only way you're going to get anywhere. Um, if we are going to seek to improve students, we have to be very specific as to what we want to do and do it across the board. Um, we're talking right now about um, cutting funding for uh, the college and career readiness. Um, so that it's only available to 11th and 12th graders, so that it's only available to students who pass a specific um, group of uh, things. And uh, that's, not to, that's not the way to improve across the board. The way to improve across the board is to have a specific goal that every student is going to be given the opportunity to make sure that they are successful. And we're not doing that right now, if you're listening to what I just said. So let's go back, look at the language, and have a plan in mind and be specific. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Saroff. And just for clarification, we're not cutting funding for for college and career readiness, or things are not just allocated for our 11th and 12th graders. That's what's being told to parents. I have a client who's dealing with that right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Madam Chair, can I do four of them for 10 minutes, no interruption? That's a 23% discount. <laughs> Let's start with the three minutes, and, um, and we'll just take it from there. All right, thank you. <laughs> Policy 3170, line number 7 into 16, says ensure every student in every school is prepared for college, etc. I believe our students need to be competing with Germany, Finland, China, and India. We should not really relate ourselves to Garrett County. Paragraph also talks about quality teaching, efficient, effective system, etc. Those adjectives are in the eyes of beholder. I think they should be defined in the policy. Item B, line 26, talks about using the data for informed decisions. I agree. But the data are as good as what goes in. So, and it's also as good as removing the noise in the data. That policy also talks about collaboration with systemic stakeholders. Reminder, Honorably board, you cut down public speakers from 10 to 5. Line number 39, item D, talks about will raise the quality of teaching and learning. I say the quality is also in the eyes of the beholder unless you define it objectively in the policy. On page 2, Line two talks about improve the involvement of principal caregivers in decision making, etc. Again, I say that you cut down the public speaking to five, and also the educational area councils are ineffective or weak, in my opinion. I finished one minute early. 
thank you. You can stay right there because next is public comment on board policy 3520, maintenance and operations, and you are our first speaker. Line number nine and number 10 talks about proper care and maintenance of facilities. I think the word proper needs to be defined. What is proper for one person is not the same for another. Line 22 and 23 and 24 talks about improvements in the facilities. I say the improvements needs to be defined in the policy. A slight improvement is not an improvement. You know, if you go a hair up, you did improvement, but that's not really a big deal. And the same about the word healthy and safe school environments. Those, those two words, I believe, should be defined in the policy. Line 26 and 27, item B, talks about the board doing annual review. So, as you know, I have been here for 25 years with the board, and nobody really kicked me out yet. I think if you do annual, like has been done before in many things, you know, obviously the school system is not really truly better a whole lot over a long period of time. I think you need to consider every six months. It is not a distrust of administration or anything like that. I think the board needs to assume the responsibility of oversight much more than the previous boards, much more. So instead of 12 months, I recommend six months as an observing person from this side out. And, and I know our superintendent will shine, but thank you. Thank you. Um, next is public comment on board policy 3532, uh, the, the restitution for vandalism. And our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Line number eight and number nine talks about the student who vandalizes board property, et cetera. My recommendation, you know, uh, idea for you that the vandals can be students, but also can be outsiders or can be employees. So I think they should be added. Line number 26 and 27 talks about will be disciplined, that's the student, in accordance with behavior code. What I would say is, where is that behavior code? Now I know I look for things online, and I'm really not a dummy with, with online, but I have the hardest time of finding things. So um, I ask you really to put it right in the policy, where do you find that code? Line 29 and 31 talks about parents responsible for restitution. I agree. However, I suggest that you consider that the students also needs to pay price. Students do have money. And somehow, you need to get permission from parents early on before they go to school that they will agree for paying the money and for the students also to pay from whatever their allowances. I think students need to be feeling it and just really disciplining them without taking money from their allowance and putting it in restitution of the school system, they would not really feel it. It would be like a slap on the head. The final thing is that I think about this policy, it really lacks addressing the root cause of vandalism. So when a student um, you know, paint swastika or something horrible about Islamophobia or Hindus or whatever, you know, or African Americans, you know, you need to study why did this thing happen. You need to go to the root of it. And the policy doesn't talk at all about addressing the root cause. So basically, we are not, you know, disciplining students and asking 
parents to pay, but we are really not looking at the root cause of it. And I, I think that would be wise for you as a board to consider. This is my comment about 35, 32. I still have 18 seconds. Thank you. So we will move on to the next board policy. So next is public comment on board policy 3620, inv inventories. And you are our first speaker, so you can move forward with your remarks. So Madam Chair, since you are friendly and I finished early, <laughs> I mean, do I get anything because I'm finishing <laughs> early? OK, I'll be serious. <clears throat> Maybe Panera Bread card? Okay. It's in the mail. This policy is good. I like it. Kudos. However, it is brief. You know, read it, please. It is really brief. It is briefer than a telegram. So I suggest that y you need to characterize what is the inventory system in uh, you are considering or, or you know you advocate for in more details in a typical characteristic fashion so i just said, suggest few things based on my knowledge i have inventories and software that the system needs to be accurate for the school system the system needs to be scalable up and down and needs to be cost effective it needs to be easy with maintenance you know, you buy a cheaper system, but cost you more maintenance, it's not cheap. And needs to be easy to teach and for the staff to learn and to use. Just my recommendations, and I have one minute and 33 seconds. Can I just sit and, no, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies. And for that, I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, chair of the policy review committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation of proposed policy changes, excuse me, proposed changes to the following board policies. Board policy 3170, framework for continuous improvement. Board Policy 3520, Maintenance and Operations. Board Policy 3532, Restitution for Vandalism. Board Policy 3620, Inventories. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibits F1 through F4. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of, board, of the Board Policies Review Committee for Board Policies 3170, 3520, 3532, and 3620? So moved from Paul. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? So I have a few. So let's go to board policy and I'll just pull up my notes. 3170, the framework for continuous improvement. And so when I think about policy, research informs policy, policy informs practice. And when I look at this policy, I'm not clear on the purpose of the policy. And how does this policy, how does this framework align with other frameworks and what's happening with Blueprint for Maryland's future? And is this policy still needed? I don't know if, Okay. And so, can you hear? So I'm saying if we have anyone from uh, Draw who can speak, and I think uh, Mr. Connolly is not with us, but Dr. Grimm has come forward to. Uh, certainly try to respond or we can take some notes back. Yes, um, Mr. Connolly was unavailable this evening. I do apologize, that was a, a last minute issue. Um, 
So in taking a look at, at this particular policy, um, it is basically, as it's noted, the framework for continuous improvement. The rule would be more specific around blueprint or any other continuous improvement cycle. So what this is intended to do is to set a frame so that we are making decisions based on data and that we're providing data literacy to our staff. So it encompasses those two really important points, um, and that is we've found, um, as Dr. Frone said, you, you know, data is only as good as the quality of that data, and the use of data is only as good as folks who are, or staff who are trained to use it properly. So that is, that's really the driving force behind the policy. Um, of course, it's up to the board to determine whether this in its form is necessary or not. And, and that is my question, because when I look at this, uh, there's elements of this and other things that are being done in the school system. So how, how tightly right now are you all adhering to this continuous improvement framework, and has it really yielded the results that you intended? Um, I'm just wondering, is it still is it needed right now, considering everything that's happening in the in the new goals and every do we do we still need this? Let me uh, respond, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I am not uh, the expert on you know. Carmar stipulates the school systems there are certain policies that we must have, uh, but our general counsel is, and so uh, with your permission, I would like to. Um, find out whether or not this is a requirement for our system. Okay. And just a comment, some some of the recommendations are in the policy analysis. I'm sure you've seen um, And I also would recommend looking at the rule compared to the policy, because if the policy is not there, the rule goes also, um, which is more specific. So, And it's about implementation. So I would certainly um, recommend that to compare the two before making any decision to completely remove the policy. And, and then if we are deciding to keep this, could it be more specific and truly set the parameters around the research for what constitutes continuous improvement? So I, I do agree with some of the speakers today in that, you know, this is the core for trying to continuously improve the school system. Then when you read the policy, it's, it is, it's very vague and it's, I just think we could frame this around like the effective practices for what the research says around continuous improvement um, if we do decide to, to keep this. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hinn. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a motion to move policy 3170 back to the policy review committee for further refinement, given your questions and concerns you raised for further discussion. Point of order. There's a motion on the floor, I believe. Because the motion right, we have the motion to accept the recommendation. Yes. May I move to amend the motion on the floor? Yes. Thank you. Um, let me pull up the list of policy numbers here. I move to accept the committee's recommendations regarding 3520, 3532, and 3620, and to move 3170 back to committee for discussion and refinement. Is there a second? Second, Stolowski. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Jaminowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. And then the next question I have is around policy 3532, the restitution for vandalism. So I, I understand that we want the student's family to, to oh, yes. So you dispensed with, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you got the we accepted everything, yes. Accepted so that. never so mind, move forward, your, move forward. No, nope. Now you have to go back to your primary motion now that's been amended and have your roll call to actually approve got it. Got it, okay. So may I have a motion to accept the recommendations of the Board Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 3520, 3532, and 3620? So moved from Pong. That was already made. Now you need a roll call. That's the roll call vote. 
I, I left out 3170. But she already amended your motion, so. Okay. It's as amended. As amended. Perfect. Okay. All right. Ms. So Sturks. may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now I would like to discuss policy 3532, restitution for vandalism. And so with this one, we're looking at having the, a student who vandalizes to, to essentially pay back or to repair, to pay the cost of repair or replacement for the vandalized property. And I'm wondering, um, given that we have a significant amount of students from low socioeconomic households, is there another way or another, uh, is there a more proactive or productive um, way to, to seek, it feels like this is the consequence, right? So is there a better consequence or another, another option? Could we have the student do community service? Could we have the student do something else? Because when you don't have any money and you're asking me for money, you're not gonna get the money. And so I would much rather see, I think that we could keep this in here and have another option. If the family cannot afford to pay, then there's something else that needs to be done. Um, just so that it's not just hanging out there um, we could do something more productive. If I could. Yes. So thank you uh, for those statements, Ms. Booker Dwyer. And I would share that the goal from pre-K on up is to be proactive and preventative, to make sure that our students value property. Um, you know, typically in schools, when we talk about the rules, when we talk about respect, we don't only talk about respecting yourself and respecting others, we talk about respecting property. And so I think ultimately the goal would be that students aren't involved in vandalizing property. Um, I, I don't also uh, think that, you know, there's there's only one option in terms of restitution. Uh, some of the things need to be repaired, and so that is, um, you know, uh, one of the things that needs to be done. But there's, uh, you know, our schools really work to restore the relationship, and part of restoring the relationship is uh, some of the things that you're talking about, whether it's community service, whether it's reflecting on the impact uh, that the vandalism had on the community as a whole, uh, you know, that's a part of our practice. I think this policy specifically just speaks to, um, you know, when you're trying to recoup the damages and certainly, um, you know, a we don't want students to vandalize to begin with. Um, we do want to recoup uh, the damages as much as possible, but there is consideration, um, you know, if students are uh, experiencing and their families are experiencing uh, significant um, economic hardship. But, you know, the goal of this policy is to uh, make it clear what our expectations are with the first and primary goal being that we don't want students vandalizing any of our property. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Pumphrey? Um, I also just wanted to point out that under the under paragraph 3B, it does, um, the policy does mention also that this is part as part of the disciplinary actions, and that's not the only action. Um, and again, just in general, to um, to this rule and, and policy, excuse me, and the remainder of the policies, anytime we're talking about specifics and being more specific in the policy, that often leads itself to the rule because that's part of the implementation, and the rule is often more specific than the actual policy. Um, so it is it's difficult to find that balance. I think especially for the public. Um, and I think it's maybe something that we could explain more in detail to the public so they understand the difference between rule, rule and policy um, and how the rule um, is where the more specifics come into play. Thank you. Ms. Hinn? Thank you. And to Ms. Pumphrey's point, I was looking at the rule and I pulled up the reference to the alternative that you recommended. Um, under 4C, it refers to the student's assignment to a school work project in it, as an option um, or as an alternative to monetary restitution. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Oh, Ms. Just kind of a general comment as far as, because we kind of bring up this a lot as far as more clarity in the policy. If we were to bring the policy and the rule together at the same time, if that might help you know, eliminate some of these, you know, can we get more specifics on the policy? And I was actually thinking that I know that when you click on the policy, you can go right to the rule, but it might be useful to just have it in with our presentation so that we can reference it more easily. OK, 
Okay. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is unfinished business, the proposed FY 2025 county capital budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. At the board's meeting on December 19th, 2023, we shared with you the proposed FY 2025 county capital budget recommendation. At your virtual board meeting on January 9th, 2024, staff were present to answer questions regarding this recommendation. This evening, we are seeking the board's approval of the proposed FY 2025 county capital budget recommendation. May I have a motion to approve the superintendent's proposed FY 2025 county capital budget? So moved, Hen. Is there a second? Second. 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 Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Thank you, Madam Chair. The board took no action that requires uh, ratification of an open session. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2025 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers and Mr. Hartlove. Good evening, board chair, Booker Dwyer, vice chair Pumphrey, members of the board. I am pleased uh, to open our work session this evening. I want to begin uh, by sharing an update on where we are with the uh, operating budget timeline. If you'll note, um, next steps after our work sessions that we've held, the public hearing and the presentation of the budget, um, include the February vote from the board, and the uh, budget is then submitted to our county executive and county council in February for the uh, final approval in May by the uh, county council and July funds for uh, July 1st, excuse me, for funds to be dispersed. Next slide. As a reminder, our budget is in direct alignment with our identified priorities for the school system. Our primary role is to ensure that all of our students are learning at high levels and they're able to demonstrate those le that level of learning um, in a variety of ways. But in order to do that, we must continue to invest in infrastructure, safety and climate, and highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff. And so we are extremely proud of the way that we have gone about this budget process. As everyone knows, it has been a challenging uh, budget process. However, we have engaged across Team BCPS for the last several months, really empowering all of our stakeholders to be a part of the process, for them to share their true um, experiences, and also help us to prioritize our needs so we can move forward and excel. We we engage staff uh, and stakeholders through community conversations, a stakeholder survey, principal survey, the new Budget 101 website, uh, dozens of meetings with our principals and central office uh, members, as well as advisory meetings. Advisory meetings consisted of principals, uh, central office staff, as well as school-based professionals that worked in a variety of roles. As a reminder, this budget is particularly challenging uh, because the ESSER funds expire at the end of September. For us, being a larger system, this is $84 million of funds that will no longer be available. Um, and if you look at this graphic, you'll note some um, critical initiatives across our school system that we must continue to move forward. This also happens to be the same year that we are receiving the small percentage of uh, allocation towards moving the blueprint for Maryland's future initiatives forward. And so 
we had to, as a school system, find a way to uh, make uh, to find some specific savings, as well as add um, needs, add items to our budget based on our identified student needs, based on our specific data. And so this slide shows uh, some documents that are inside of our budget book that has been uh, published uh, for this proposed budget. Uh, in the executive summary, you will find a uh, summary of the general fund categories and uh, what's depicted there, the FY24 adjusted category compared to the FY25 proposed, and that gives everyone um, information about the difference, whether there will be an increase increase, a proposed increase, or a proposed decrease in that specific area. Um, we also have the uh, pie chart depicting where the expenditures are going across the system proposed for FY25. And while, um, as a school system, we have committed to working on safety and climate, safety and climate is more than just um, ensuring the physical safety or social emotional safety of students and staff when they're in the building. A lot of the work that happens in our school is supported by our central office staff members on a regular basis. And so one of the things that we discussed um, as uh, senior leadership was uh, in our past practices how inadvertently uh, staff members would find out that their positions were being cut uh, through a budget presentation. Um, when there was a specific position uh, th that was available the previous year and the next year, the projected year, you saw a zero. Uh, that is how people found out that they were losing uh, their positions. Uh, we have committed to improving the climate and across Team BCPS. We have also committed to treating all of our employees with the respect um, that they deserve. And so, um, as I shared at the very beginning of the budget book in the budget uh, letter, uh, the first operating book provides division roll-ups. And on this slide, you'll see an example from page 197. So for those who are interested in exactly where the cuts may be, here is an example where you're able to see the FY24 adjusted budget items. You see the professional and support staff numbers. You'll see a difference in terms of the FY25 proposal as well as specific dollar amounts for budget by object classes, um, specifically calling out salaries and wages, contracted services, supplies and materials, other charges, equipment, and transfers. This information is provided in our um, budget book for every single division. Uh, it also gives us the uh, time to notify staff members directly of any changes to their current position as well as options that exist uh, within the system for all of our represented staff uh, to make sure that they are taken care of for the upcoming year. And as stated in the beginning of the budget book, um, and I want to share again for the public, our next two iterations of the book, since we typically um, share three versions of the book. The first proposed one, the March um, book, as well as one after we've had final approval from all parties. Those next two versions will include the department level data. Next slide, please. But I wanted to spend some time this evening really speaking to the savings um, to answer some of the questions that we received and make sure that our public has um, a strong understanding of how we were able to uh, find these cost savings. Uh, so this sl slide speaks to the position reductions that were not in schools. Uh, these positions, the 239 positions that were identified in the budget, uh, they were across divisions. As shared, uh, you know, uh, prior, uh, we had every division at the table. We had all department um, leaders being an active part of this process. I would estimate about 200 staff members uh, actively participating in identifying um, positions that were chronically vacant. Why that's important is even if a position is chronically vacant for a school system, when you are developing the budget, it is your responsibility to still fund those positions. And so we took 
took a deep dive and identified those positions that were chronically va uh, vacant. We also talked about our increased vac uh, efficiencies that we've been able to put in place uh, last year and this year, um, you know, eliminating, uh, allowing us to eliminate redundancies and to uh, make some uh, reductions in areas. And again, that commitment to uh, no layoffs for any represented staff, the same commitment that we made to all of our union partners. Uh, the staff that you see, see there details the divisions, um, you know, to show you where, um, you know, the we were able to save uh, money. Um, specifically, it's also important to note um, that in the other areas, uh, H, you know, human resources, chief of staff, and finance, um, you see a smaller amount, and those are our divisions that are extremely lean to begin with. Next slide, please. Another area uh, for savings was in class sizes, and wanted to really uh, present um, some information for all of our public uh, to understand what this means. So on one side of the slide, you will see uh, the class sizes proposed for FY25. Um, in bold, you see the numbers for grade three through five. That is with a reduction in class size. That brings us to 24. Um, we shared from the beginning that there was a slight increase uh, in secondary schools. But if you'll note, uh, that slight increase in secondary schools still has our middle schools at the same level with kindergarten through grade two. And it also has our high school uh, still under the number that we have for grades three through five at this time by eliminating, uh, reducing the class size by one. Next slide, please. The next item that I wanted to call to everyone's attention is responsibility factors. Responsibility factors are part of our negotiated agreement, um, and they are um, uh, funds that specific roles receive uh, above and beyond um, their uh, salary uh, for doing um, additional work to move departments forward. So they are typically for department chairs, team leaders, as well as our nurses. And so we were able to uh, reduce the uh, amount of expenditures from four and a half million dollars, we were able to save $1.8 million in this area. Part of that, approximately $400,000, was by moving our nurse responsibility factor to a grant that we received for nursing. Um, and then the other part came from reducing um, the allocations for middle schools and high schools. Um, we right-sized those responsibility factors in alignment with the content areas that we have in our schools. And so we're moving in high school from 15 to 9 and middle school from 14 to 8. Um, those do not count special education and counseling. We will continue to have department chairs in those areas. Um, we also are going to standardize our expectations for teaching courses in those areas. Uh, when we analyzed our report, there was great variability across our system, and department chairs and team leaders were teaching everything from zero classes to a full load. Um, and so we are standardizing uh, that across the system. And then the other information provided is uh, what does uh, the allocations that are provided in neighboring school systems, um, what does that look like so that there can be a comparison uh, with where we are moving to as a school system with those savings. Next slide talks about zero-based budgeting. When we talked about the amount of savings that we knew we were going to have to realize, uh, early on we talked about two things that we had to do as a school system uh, in order to start saving. Part of that was uh, to put a freeze on central office uh, positions that were not essential and put in a process if there, was, if there were positions that we needed to fill those vacancies. But the other piece was zero-based budgeting. Uh, typically in a large school system, um, the budget is created annually by providing people what we call the built-ins, the amount that has been spent in prior years, and then departments and divisions have an opportunity um, to identify additional 
additional expenditures uh, that they feel are needed. This year, we did not follow that process. This year, um, everyone started with zero, and they were asked to build a budget um, to make their request, to provide a rationale for every line item that they were requesting. Uh, being honest with you, because this was very new, um, our um, team members had a little bit of struggle with this task at first. At first, they thought the task was to build back up to the money that they used to receive. Um, we all came back together and shared that this was not indeed the task. Um, and what we didn't want to do is to sit at a table and make some blind decisions of what areas we needed to cut. We wanted these decisions to be well informed by the people that were closest to the work. So we shared with them, um, you know, uh, gave them another opportunity to go back to the table and make those decisions based on the work that they're doing, based on the new efficiencies. And what you see in front of you um, are the results that they came back with. Um, it is divided by division, uh, where you are able to see FY24 adjusted, where we ended up by division, and where we were um, after the zero-based budgeting exercise, uh, informed not only by the uh, chiefs that lead those divisions, uh, but really the department heads and leads that work in the divisions um, across Team BCPS, yielding those savings. Next slide, please. We also were able to realize some savings with built-in budgets. Um, built-in budgets include items such as health insurance, other employee benefits, FICA, workers' compensation, um, utilities, retirement, and things of that nature. I want to make it very clear that we are not reducing funding in any of these areas, but what our budget and finance team did uh, was they took a deep dive into our actual expenditures into these areas. And based on um, that, through that thorough review, uh, we were able to make changes where we realigned our budget requests to the amount of money that we needed to spend in these areas, and that uh, resulted in approximately uh, $10 million worth of additional savings. So this slide, again, uh, reminds us of the task in front of us. We have a difficult task in front of us, but extremely important work. Work to make sure that all of our students from the very beginning, when they step foot in our pre-Ks, all the way to when they leave us as graduates of Baltimore County Public Schools, that they're a college uh, career and community ready. And so we must n invest in academic achievement, infrastructure, safety and climate, as well as highly effective staff, because it takes our people to get this work done. When we really take a look at our data, as we've been sharing throughout the year and will continue um, to share, it calls our attention to focusing on English language arts, mathematics, meeting the needs of our students um, who are multilingual learners, as well as our students receiving special education services. And so that is why this budget invests heavily in those four priority areas. We also are responsible for continuing to advance Blueprint for Maryland's future, making sure that we have robust early childhood education programs, again, making sure that we are expanding um, access and opportunity to have high quality and diverse teachers and leaders across our um, schools and offices, making sure that we're investing in their professional development, uh, providing more opportunities for our students to be college and career ready after um, they have demonstrated that. Um, it's important to note that students are unable to demonstrate college and career readiness until the end of grade 10 uh, per uh, MSDE requirements. And so that's an important distinction um, that we should uh, highlight as a school system. And uh, lastly, making sure that we are investing more resources uh, for those students who need more resources in order for them to be successful. Um, that's where our work with community schools comes in, as well as our intentional focus on providing more resources for special education and our multilingual learners. 
wanted to call everyone's attention back to our trajectory. Um, as I shared during the budget presentation, we were able to work with psychometricians to really identify what are the steps along the way that our students need to take so that by the time they reach the end of 10th grade and they have taken all of those assessments, they're able to demonstrate readiness. Um, you'll note that the first marker is in kindergarten. And so the work that we do to expand pre-K will have a significant impact on making sure that our students are able to demonstrate readiness on the kindergarten readiness assessment. There are two markers in elementary school. Uh, we have designed this budget to make sure that we're investing, reinvesting heavily at the foundation so that it, when we look at our maps for student performance across a variety of measures in elementary schools, uh, we are able to help our students uh, to demonstrate high levels of reading. Um, at the end of grade three, as well as in grade five, making sure that our students are demonstrating, uh, demonstrating proficiency or above proficiency on the MCAP in literacy as well as mathematics. In eighth grades, successful completion of algebra one with a grade of C or higher um, is a goal, and you will note a variety of measures to, that demonstrate college and career readiness at the high school level. So the remaining slides um, simply provide a reminder of our um, ask before we open it up for uh, any and all questions for achievement, um, making sure that we are reducing those class sizes in grades three through five. Uh, those class sizes were originally at 25, the largest in our entire school system. Um, for elementary, investing um, in math lead teachers as a pilot. Um, making sure that we have that job embedded professional development in our schools and um, responding to our needs of our community uh, for the virtual academy program, expanding the reach of our online teaching options, and uh, in college and career readiness, really partnering uh, with our partners, workforce development at county government, uh, to have 25 new positions that really focus on that um, career counseling uh, that our students need, as well as addressing the growth uh, needed for our new schools. We also are, are, um, have proposed that we move forward with um, aggressive expansion of our pre-K programs um, aligned in the areas where we have the greatest need. This is also aligned with the data that we have from the blueprint in terms of where our highest population of tier one students are living. Um, we in addition to providing teachers, we also want to make sure that we are providing those special area teachers, the paraeducators necessary, um, as well as the additional assistance to provide the support for our students and the requisite uh, special education support so that our youngest learners have access to their home schools to receive um, services in pre-kindergarten. We also to continue to grow our population of multilingual learners. Um, as shared before, our multilingual learners are lagging behind um, in many of our measures. And so investing in additional ESOL teachers as we move more middle school and high school students back to their home schools and investing um, in a new English language learner curriculum using one-time funds is the request. in the area of special education. Um, identifying this as a priority. Uh, when we look at our uh, enrollment, we see that there was a dip, um, you know, as, as a result of the pandemic. Our numbers went back up um, and, and we're close to near where we were before the pandemic, but we also know that because a lot of the uh, learning uh, loss that has occurred, um, we are spending more money on special education non-public placements. And so in the request, you see um, an, an additional request for special education non-public placements, but you also see a request to provide additional special education teachers across all of our grades to meet the needs of our students, as well as providing those elementary school IEP chairs so that we are providing um, supports as early as possible and working with our families and our students to meet their needs. 
in the area of safety and climate. Uh, we have over 170 safety assistants deployed in our secondary schools and a uh, differentiated model in elementary schools. So moving that over to the operating budget, as well as moving forward with phase two of our athletic trainers are the two requests that we have. Using blueprint funding, um, uh, we want to continue to expand our blueprint community schools, making sure that we're providing all of the supports that are necessary uh, for our students and families, uh, mental, physical, social, emotional, and academic, including extracurricular activities. And then our final area, which is infrastructure, sorry, next to final area, infrastructure, um, additional transportation contract buses, um, providing additional staff for facilities and grounds in our new schools, um, devices, uh, cases to protect our devices um, and to help us with saving at our middle school uh, for our middle school students, which is a great area of need, as well as providing those desktop needed for staff members, uh, utility, rising utility costs and startup costs for our new uh, buildings that are slated to uh, open next school year. And finally, uh, investing in our people, making sure that we're able to uh, fund our compensation increases, move over to the operating budget, uh, the costs for extending um, our school day uh, to be uh, on par with all other school systems across the state of Maryland, as well as continuing to provide those adjustments necessary for our contractual um, and substitute uh, staff members and uh, pay for the uh, rising costs of benefits for staff members. And so with that, I uh, turn it over to board members. We are happy to answer any and all questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Board members, do you have questions? Yes, Ms. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Rogers, for the outstanding presentation. I have two questions regarding staffing. And I also appreciate you answering our written questions we submitted. Those provided a lot of the answers we needed. Thank you. Um, could you speak to the number of employees impacted, and these would be non-represented employees, by the position reductions? I believe it's 250, give or take. How many actual employees will be impacted by those reductions? So I don't have that number off the top of my head, but what I can tell you is, uh, so we have 239, um, you know, when we're talking about um, offices and we're not talking about um, school base. We, we work very hard to stay far away from schools because after all, we're working on academic achievement. And so we, we didn't want to do anything that would adversely impact even though we had these financial challenges. Um, I will tell you that the vast majority of positions, uh, and when I say vast majorities, I mean in the, 90, the high 90 percentile, um, uh, were uh, vacant positions. And so, you know, going back to that explanation where we were still continuing to fund chronically vacant positions that either we had increased efficiencies and so they were no, no longer um, needed or um, they were chronically vacant and not being filled but still um, causing that burden on the system, uh, that was one way that we were able to do this work. And again, not, not in isolation, not random decisions, really bringing uh, department leads and vision heads to the table to have those conversations about you know what that meant so if, for example if we had an area where there were over 200 uh, you know vacant positions how many did we really need um, we didn't cut to zero so if we had 200 um, you know maybe it looks like we have a hundred now uh, because you know we want to continue to recruit and you know to have additional uh, people available what I would say high 90s um, you know that were were vacant, I would say, um, you know, we, we have a, a few dozen filled and a much smaller number of uh, non-represented. Um, and, and I make that distinction because as a part of our negotiated agreement, um, we have guidelines that we've agreed to follow and we absolutely will follow them to a T in terms of finding positions where people have uh, are qualified, where they have been successful um, in the past to make that match and uh, for our chief of human resources uh, to work to um, you know, have that conversation with people, uh, make the 
the offer, uh, give them, uh, you know, these uh, opportunities uh, so that we are um, losing as few people, if any, uh, across Team BCPS. We really want to invest in our people and really want to respect the work that they do in a re on a regular basis, in addition to being fiscally responsible and meeting the challenge that's in front of us, um, you know, with the needs of our student in addition to the $84 million from ESSER. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, our people come first. Absolutely. And that's a point that makes me nervous looking at the numbers. But hearing you say that 90 percent um, are chronically vacant positions, and your graphic was very helpful to that effect. Um, if I do the math in my head, that's about 24 individuals, non-represented employees, potentially affected. Um, when we talk about classroom positions, um, 255 classroom teachers won't be furloughed, they're protected against furloughs, but they, how many of those would you say are um, chronically vacant? So teachers is different. So when you look at teachers, I want us to think about the number of teachers that we typically hire in a year. So typically we hire 800 to 1,000 teachers in a year. Um, so we're not going to be in the position where we, you know, are, um, doing that. So if we hired a thousand and that was a flat number and 255 uh, was the number that we identified through savings, it would mean for us that we would hire 745 uh, the following year if we had the same level of turnover. So some turnover is going to happen because, you know, people are going to retire, people are going to be promoted within the system as well as um, outside. Um, you know, everyone knows that we are doing our level best to retain as many um, people as possible, you know, so so teachers looks a little different, but you also see that we are adding in the proposed budget some teacher positions. So when we're talking about 35 more special education teachers, we're talking about, you know, those special area teachers um, in the budget when we're talking about the pre-K teachers that we need. So it, it's not as uh, black and white as, you know, it's 255 and 255 are going from somewhere. Our goal is to keep as many of those people here um, for as long as possible, 30 years and beyond. We want them here and we're adding more teachers. But where we're making the change is we had to make the adjustments to secondary to really start that important work that we needed in grade three through five. Particularly if you look at that data and the importance of our data of making sure that our students by the end of grade three are reading at or above uh, proficiency level and seeing that they were at 25, which was larger than even our high schools, a uh, higher class size. So we were only able to do it step one this year um, if everything passes which brings us to 24. So they're still the highest uh, in the school system, but we're moving it in the uh, right direction. Sure, and I appreciate that we're moving towards those priorities. The board fully supports you in that. Um, so it's more difficult to categorize teaching positions as chronically vacant since that's constant, that number is constantly in flux. It's, um, it's constantly in flux, so and we looked at things like, um, you know, if we had specific uh, positions for years that had been uh, vacant, um, you know, like a specialized niche area, uh, but the principals for the last three years, um, you know, they've, they've been able to uh, make it work with uh, reasonable, you know, good class sizes, particularly since at high school we were, you know, much uh, smaller on that on those class sizes. We were able to look at that data and say, this has been open for years. Um, you know, we've checked the class sizes as, you know, we have that full report that you have. It, it's not causing uh, undue burden on our students and the ability of other students to learn. And so in those, you know, isolated instances, we were able to make those kinds of reductions as well. That's fantastic. And this exercise, and it's a lot of work, so I appreciate you and the efforts of all your team, Thank you. um, has not been done, at least in my time on the board that I'm aware of, in making, in right-sizing our, our staffing based on looking at those, like you said, chronically vacant positions and eliminating those because they still have to be funded whether they are, are filled or not. So to your knowledge, is that an accurate statement that this is new work that is happening um, as part of not necessarily your zero-based budgeting process, but in looking at what are our actual needs versus what, what we're funding that could be reallocated? So, uh, you know, I, I can't speak with 100 specificity of what, you know, 
people might have done, um, you know, behind uh, closed doors in the past. But what I can tell you is we took a deep dive. We looked everywhere. We also looked at places that perhaps in the past uh, enrollment had surged. And so based on the staffing allocation formulas, we had provided additional staffing. But over years, those numbers went down. Um, and, and so those are, you know, uh, conversations that are easy to have with our principal colleagues uh, because, um, you know, there's already a formula. So we looked at all of those places and all of those savings. I, I can share that we took a comprehensive um, look uh, together with everyone you know, across the board uh, this year. This was just a part of the work because we wanted to um, stay away from touching people. You know, uh, we know that, you know, the fiscal outlook, um, you know, nationally is still going to be tight as we continue to move forward. Uh, but we really value our people and need our people to do this work. And so we looked at things first, which, you know, you, you saw the big areas with that. And then when we looked at people, we tried to look at um, potential people as much as possible. And then, you know, to uh, look at, you know, efficiencies that were um, necessary um, and, and places that we could uh, eliminate uh, redundancies and really just standardize our formulas. Uh, you know, when I gave that example about uh, department chairs and the great variability that we found, um, you know, as part of our process moving forward, being able to say here are our expectations so that we can budget because when you when you pay for a position um, and you pay for a responsibility factor and there are reduced classes that you're teaching in essence the school system is paying for that as well because it might cause a swell in some areas or it might cause a request for additional staffing that is provided and you know those come at a cost to the school system. Thank you. And my final question, and then I'll turn it back to my colleagues, um, is magnet programs and the reductions there. We heard from two students tonight speak to very eloquently speak to the value of our magnet programs, and we are fully committed to to supporting them. Um, it's one thing to reduce promotional materials or things that are non-essential. Um, when I read in the budget book that staffing could be affected, that makes me nervous. So could you speak to the division of that half million that's being reduced from school magnet allocations and what that looks like in, in the schoolhouse? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And, and I, too, uh, compliment our students who uh, were here this evening and has, have come to uh, several sessions um, to, you know, share with us the impact that elementary uh, STEM magnet programs have had on them. Um, and so that half a million dollars, you know, as shared, it's uh, the so the reduction is, um, you know, we had some additional funds that we put together, uh, you know, uh, for Magnet with ESSER. Um, and so those funds, uh, you know, obviously expire at September 30th. Um, but we also had a process where we, uh, very similar to the zero-based budgeting, where we didn't reach out to schools and ask them, what do you need to move forward? Um, we kind of just said, you know, here's what we're providing. So the vast majority of that money, um, you know, when we look at the amount of money that was spent on promotional materials, the vast majority of that money is going to be um, absorbed in that way. When we say promotional materials, we're talking about high gloss copies and, you know, maybe some shirts and some things of that nature. So a lot of it is things. Uh, but we also created a uh, process uh, where um, Dr. Elmendorf, who leads um, our magnet programs, um, schools, they submit a, a budget request with the just justification, just like our zero-based budgeting. Um, and then they're going to provide, uh, you know, those approvals based on uh, the needs um, identified by the schools. And so we were able to take a look, again, looking at those actual expenditures versus what we had allocated, as well as looking at, you know, uh, past practices where th there is that time and space where there's money left and people spend it. Um, but is it something, you know, that we had a lot of expenditures throughout the year showing us this demonstrated need uh, to spend that money on students? And so we're confident, um, you know, that that, uh, because, again, we are um, prioritizing our students, we're confident that that cut is mostly on things, and we're also confident that this process is going to make sure that every school has what they need. And you had mentioned in your responses that a portion of that, those funds were not spent when you talked about looking at actual expenditures. Do you have any ballpark estimate on what percentage of that not off might the be top not of my spent? head? Not the off the top of my head. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Hinn. Other questions from the board, uh, Ms. Delesky and Mr. McMillian. Okay. 
Thank you for being so intentional and purposeful with this budget. I know it was really challenging. Um, my, class, my questions just relate to class sizes, and I have two. So one, um, knowing that there has to be some increases in the class sizes, can you speak to the community, teachers, stakeholders, et cetera, about what the secondary increases in class si sizes will actually mean in practicality? And then do you have um, anticipation in a long-term plan to reduce class sizes across the board in the future. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So I'll start with the second question, and thank you for those uh, thoughtful questions. So the first question, or the second question about do we have plans long term to reduce? Absolutely. As soon as we get back to a place where we're able to reduce, um, yes, that, that is within uh, our reach and part of our uh, long-term plan. Um, uh, the first question in terms of really speaking directly to our teachers, our teacher leaders, and our parents, um, you know, what does this mean? This is where that comprehensive look and comprehensive approach is going to pay dividends. And so, um, you know, when I, when I talked about um, looking at uh, our department chairs and team leaders, for example, you saw that great variability from zero to five uh, classes. And so those release periods have an impact on what happens in the classroom. Another area where we saw that was school-based resource teachers, where we provide these positions in the school, and you had some of them that taught in classes, and then you had some that taught a few or a few numbers in between. Our goal, and we're actually meeting with all of our principals to provide um, um, you know, staffing allocations on the 25th, um, so that is the day after tomorrow. Uh, we are providing a comprehensive memo where we speak to all of these areas that we learned throughout this process that we had variability because either things changed over time or we didn't have anything in writing. We've really brought people to the table to talk about what makes sense and what's best for students. And so we, we strongly believe by reducing, um, you know, the, the release periods and, you know, making sure sure that we have standardized expectations for what specific positions are doing across the system, uh, that we really should not see any great fluctuations in terms of secondary. Again, secondary was even lower uh, than our intermediate grades in elementary. And one of the reports that I you know, provided, it, it gives you the summary by course elementary, middle, and high um, for the average class size. But then when you look underneath it, it shows you everything that lives underneath that for, you know, what are the class sizes in specific numbers. And, and you'll find when you, you know, peruse that report that you don't see large numbers jumping out at you. So this, you know, we're hoping that this is only going to improve that. So thank you. Mr. McMillian. I really appreciate your involvement in the construction of this budget because it's obvious by the way that you're speaking to the detail. You didn't refer to anybody out there. You can speak to it because you were involved in, in the process. I also appreciate how you walk through your leaders through the, the, uh, the budget process, where you scaled it down, the zero-based budget, because I think that that's something that's been needed for quite a while. But the, the piece that I have a difficult time with is on my five years on the board and seeing five budgets come through, you know, it's pitched to us that it's our budget. And it's constructed by you and your staff, but people say it's our budget. We vote on this budget. I'm finding it very difficult to conceptualize voting for a budget where I can't see detail. Like once finalized by the board, the adopted 25 operating budget will include, will include, will include. So if I'm going to be physically prudent and with my vote, I, how, can I, how can I vote for something I can't see? So and can you can you talk me off my cliff? I'm going to talk you right off the cliff, where I'm going to do a, uh, do my best to help you. Talk me off the cliff. Yes, I'm going to attempt. Um, and so what I would say to you, uh, Mr. McMillian, is you do have the information. So when you look at the division roll-ups, it speaks specifically to here's where we were. Here's where we're trying to go. So you can see in the specific areas where we had the savings. When you look at the slide that I shared, you know, this evening about the divisions, so you can see where those savings are. So when we say to people that this was across divisions, this wasn't one isolated place, there is evidence across 309 pages that this happened. But I think one of the things that we have to all continue to be committed to when we're talking about recruitment and retention where we want people to stay is 
demonstrate that level of respect that we have for them. Um, I think there are people who have been in this room and watched people's faces change when they heard in a public board presentation that next to their position was a zero. I would never want to be in that position. And as the leader that you entrust with the care and concern of this school system, I would never want to put people in that school system. And so my work, my responsibility, is to make sure you and the public have the division information, also to share in a timely fashion with those individuals what their options are, and to answer you know, questions that I can in a public uh, fashion so people understand how we did the work, where the savings are coming from, uh, what lives underneath that without exposing those. Um, I think part of it um, also, and, and I'm not going to say that part of this is, is about um, trust, because there are numbers in black and white. So like page 197 for curriculum and instruction, there's one that's there for the division of schools. There's one that's there for operations. There's one that's there for every single department. And so I think it's about shifting how we're doing business. If we want differentiated outcomes to continue to do things in the way that we did, um, where, you know, we came together and talked about how do we improve climate and morale? How do we make sure that we're attracting people? How do we make sure, you know, I've been very proud to see people come to this board meeting um, and, you know, we're appointing them, uh, you're appointing them, uh, approving the appointment, and they're coming from other school systems um, during the school year. This is a place where we want people want to, to be where they want to come, and we want our people who are here um, that, you know, that they want to stay. And so I I have been speaking to them personally about our investment in them, about how they've been a part of this process, about the respect that we're going to show to them. Um, I think it would then be disingenuous for me to turn around and in the biggest presentation that we have to provide to the public to show them that their cuts and their positions are in a book. And so I am happy to sit down with you and anybody else to go through division by division. Um, you know, if um, the information that I gave to, uh, this evening wasn't sufficient in terms of the division, to show you exactly where you see the professional, where you see the supporting, and then you see those other budget classes. Um, happy to, you know, share that information with you. But I, I think the information that you have in front of you uh, demonstrates our commitment to um, really keep our word with people, uh, to really walk through a process openly, honestly, to really look at everything, to value people first, but then at the very end when we have to make difficult decisions, which is what you have to do as a school system, um, to do it in such a way that we're still valuing and honoring people to the end. And, and I want to say thank you very much for your answer. And I know it might seem that I'm being critical of you, but I'm, I'm trying to understand the process. Absolutely. And you have my support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Pumphrey. My questions were answered, but I just have a, have a comment that, again, um, I just appreciate the why. So when these things come in front of us and people look and they're like, oh, no, this looks different. Why does this look different? Why isn't this included? I appreciate that your responses include the why so that everyone understands us and, and including the public why it looks a little bit different and why things may be the way they are. So just, just a comment. I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Frumpong. Um. So I was glad to see that at the school-based budget, we do see that the um, number of support staff has increased, and it's increased by 109 um, full-time equivalents. Um, but I was looking, so that's from page 122, but I did have a question from page 125, um, where just where do the numbers come from when we start talking about thresholds? Um, so, for example, when it refers to clerical and the student population, if it's 500 students or more, then we get additional assistance. But that's different than from a reading specialist where the number is 700. So where do those numbers come from as far as thresholds for the support staff? I appreciate that question. So that's, um, you know, historical. Um, I would have to dig deeper to find out, you know, I think some of them have been you know, part of the allocation uh, formulas for, you know, more than a decade, whereas uh, some I uh, 
I specifically asked the question around department chairs and, you know, found out that, you know, the number of allocations that had been practiced for three to four years. Um, and so we would have to do some more work to, you know, to find out historically where they came from uh, at the very beginning, as well as, you know, identifying uh, this is, you know, probably some of uh, work for the FY26 budget where there's uh, more room where we also identify, you know, we, I always try to benchmark with uh, neighboring districts or similarly situated districts that might be outside of our neighbors to, to make sure that we're aligned with those best practices. Uh, but, I, but I think, um, you know, the short answer is, you know, many of them are historical in nature. The why, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you that, but we can certainly go on a journey to find out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then the next question would be um, the, the nurses. So there was the reduction um, for the nurses um, as far as the money because there's grant funding. So that's from page 124. But then when you look at, again, this same school allocation, there's only one nurse per school. And there was some data in here just talking about there's 450,000 health suite visits, there's 80,000 medical treatments, and all of that is just one nurse. So can you talk more to that? Sure. Um, so, you know, in my younger days, I thought I was going to be a nurse because I came from two generations of nurses and obviously I didn't make that decision. Um, so I, I have high, I hold nurses, physicians, all in uh, very high esteem and high regards. What I will um, share with you is um, just, you know, for the uh, record, we're not making any changes, no reductions in nurses, no reductions in our health assistance, no reductions in the responsibility factors. As you pointed out, um, we are changing the funding source, so that is a net savings for us on the operating budget. Um, but I will share with you of all the systems that I'm aware of, uh, the allocation is, um, you know, uh, one nurse. That might be an area uh, where we can uh, partner um, with, you know, perhaps our, um, you know, external partners to um, see, you know, if there's a long-term plan to uh, make some increases. I know in our uh, community schools, of which uh, we think we're going to be above 80 next year, uh, one of the um, areas where we provide support is um, health services. And so, um, you know, that that usually comes with a health assistant, and we also um, usually work with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, medical uh, clinic uh, providers for our families in those areas. And so, uh, having over 80 of that of those, um, I think, will help to. Um, provide some additional support to our nurses, but I, I think um, it would have to be a much, you know, longer uh, term plan. But again, this is another area where we can um, take a look at our, um, I, I know what the neighboring um, systems are if they haven't um, changed, but it, it's definitely something we can um, look into as well as our uh, very uh, collaborative and helpful county government uh, partners, um, you know, in our health department that really works with us hand in hand on a regular basis. Yep, go ahead. Um, my last question actually is kind of, um, it's a follow-up. I believe Ms. Hen had asked the question about the 18 uh, math specialists, and then I saw a slide that spoke to the schools. And I guess my question is, how are those schools determined? Because if we look at the map um, information that's in here, some of the lower schools, I didn't see those names. So how is it that we're allotting the math specialists to you know, more affluent in, in schools that have the better scores versus the ones that are less affluent and, and don't have as good scores? Great question. So the first answer is, um, if we could have provided one to everyone, we absolutely would have. Uh, but, you know, with over 100 elementary schools, um, that wasn't something that we could have done. Uh, so. And, you know, when you're designing a pilot, part of what you want to do is have a range of schools. So we didn't want only Title I schools. We didn't want only affluent schools. We wanted a uh, mix. Uh, but uh, we also looked at additional resources um, that were available. Uh, part of our concerted effort moving forward is going to be uh, to make sure that we have a math expert in every single elementary school and we're able to provide them with that professional development. But we're also able to, in real time, um, you know, have indicators of how our students are doing on our math curriculum. And so in those spaces, I think, um, 
each every single one of the spaces that were identified, we didn't have a dedicated uh, math expert, uh, but we were able to look across other schools where we had, um, you know, either with additional funds where you have a you know school-based math resource teacher um, that can support that work that we can bring all of them together uh, throughout the course of this pilot um, to really focus on um, implementing the mathematics curriculum uh, with fidelity and also monitoring the progress of our students and making you know those course correction, uh, corrections in real time. So that's how we uh, decided on the schools. You're welcome. Other questions, Ms. Lichter? Um, more comments, because a lot of my questions were answered. One, as a former elementary principal, the idea of IEP facilitators lowering the ratio in grades three to five and the math specialist are things that we have been needing desperately for years and years. So thank you for wading through all of the um, all the information and all of the funds to start to fund that in our schools. And it's so aligned with the needs that we've seen. So um, thank you for that. The um, one question I had was the English language learners um, piece. And the 84% of elementary kids gaining scores is huge. So that, you know, there's a lot of points in here that are pointing, showing us it's pointing in the right direction. Um, is, there P is the PD amount of 31,000 enough? Can considering the increase of teachers and that there aren't experts for ELL in the schools? So um, this is a great area where we're able to leverage uh, grant funding. Okay. Um, so we have some, I think it's Title III, Title III funding, uh, where we can use that uh, specifically for English language learners, and that's what we're going to um, leverage to provide additional professional development. Um, so part of this exercise was also looking at how we can maximize grant funding uh, to meet some of our needs, um, you know, use our Title II funding in different ways um, than, you know, perhaps we've used them in the past. And so that's, that's what we're going to use in addition to, you know, our um, uh, director of um, ESOL and World Languages on the curriculum and instruction side, who's really focusing on that piece. And then we have the Director of Multilingual Achievement on the school side, really focusing on getting to uh, inside of schools, what are the needs of the um, principals and the teachers in the uh, classroom as well as uh, ELA to provide you know, some of that support. Uh, one of the areas showing promise is uh, HMH. HMH provides resources for our multilingual learners, um, as well as you know, our um, uh, students in need of additional supports and our high, uh, very high achieving uh, students. And so I think uh, using some existing resources as well as Title III allows us to um, do what we need to. Um, they have come up with a very robust plan uh, in terms of, you know, what, what our next steps look like, including, um, you know, this summer and beyond. Thank you. And then just one last comment. I appreciate, I understand the frustration or the not seeing all of the details about people, but I sat in Ms. Booker Dwyer's seat last year and watched people in the audience find out that their positions had been cut, and it was, it, it was heart-wrenching. So while I understand we, we may feel we're missing information, the look on those people's faces to hear that their future was now not in jeopardy, but that they did not have their position back was, was very hard. So I appreciate that being the paramount um, consideration for this. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions from board members? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Rogers, for um, answering all of our questions, for providing clarity um, to the budget. Um, I definitely think it reflects the school system that we are aspiring to be, where we are putting people first, where we're investing in our students, and, um, and really respecting the, the professionalism of adults by not detailing um, positions and, and that, that detailed departmental um, budget list. So thank you for that. The board is scheduled to vote on the FY 2025 operating budget at the February 27th, 2024 board meeting. Okay, we still have more on the agenda. That was a... <laughs> All right, so the next item on the agenda is the report on the Maryland Star rating system. And for that, I call on Dr. Jones, Dr. DiDonato, and Mr. Connolly.
Dr. Jones and Dr. DiDonato. Thank you. Yes, uh, one of our trio is not with us this evening, but we're going to do our best to give a good show for him. So we'll kind of just jump jump right in. Um, Dr. Rogers, we didn't know if you wanted to say something. You have said a lot, <laughs> um, and you did it well. And you did it well, so we're going to just get started. We're going to get started. Um, we're here today, um, um, <laughs> Chair Booker Dwyer and Vice Chair Humphrey. We are here, and members of the board, we are here to present the 2022-23 ESSA star ratings. Um, joined with me is my colleague, um, Dr. DiDonato, and as was stated, Mr. Conley, whose um, DRA team is a representation of Dr. Jess Grimm and the um, Chief Operations Officer. Um, due to an emergency, he is not um, here, but they did contribute a lot to what you're going to see, and we wanted to make sure. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we really wanted to point out and really um, start off the presentation around is that the Maryland Report Card really advances equity through ESSA. As we know, the um, ESSA stands for Every Student Succeeds Act, and it, was, it has established an accountability system here within Maryland focused on equitably preparing students for college and career success. The plan closes, closely aligns with the system's focus on equity and increased academic achievement, and it gives us an opportunity to really think about our um, priority around increasing academic achievement and closing gaps for students. Next slide, please. So the Maryland, the Maryland report card reading, as you can see there, school performance is measured through indicators, and those indicators are, are there for all schools, academic progress for elementary and middle, progress in achieving English language proficiency is also for all schools. And then we have our graduation rate, which we're all familiar with for high schools, quality or student success for all schools, and then readiness for post-secondary post success, again, is for all schools. And off to the side, you can kind of see um, the stars and the awarding of the stars based on the percentages that are received. Next slide, please. We wanted to highlight some of the changes in the ESSA report card from 2022 to 2023. I know that when we look at those report cards and we compare them from one year to the next, um, we believe that it's a true measure. However, there are some metrics changes that occur between the 2022 report card and the 2023 report card. We wanted to highlight some of those changes for you because it gives some insight into some of the score changes. So at the top of the slide, you can see chronic absenteeism. So chronic absenteeism calculation reverted to the original pre-COVID calculation metrics that was used. During 2022, recognizing that students' attendance was still being impacted by COVID, the chronic absenteeism rate metrics changed so that it was a lower threshold. So it allowed more flexibility for schools with a higher level of chronic absenteeism. For 2023, it returned to the pre-COVID rate. So while we had schools who dramatically improved their chronic absenteeism rate, it didn't come to fruition in seeing that number change for the star rating purpose because the metric had actually increased. So they had improved it. However, they were, they were chasing after a number at that point. The English uh, language proficiency, so this is looking at the achievement of our students um, making progress to acquire English. One of the differences, again, um, between 2022 and 2023, the WIDA assessment is what's used to uh, evaluate students' progress towards English language proficiency, and the timeline for administration was uh, cut short. Um, and so the assessment from 2022 to 2023 measured progress over a single school year. The 2022 school year score was actually a much longer time because there were options and waivers in 2021 for administering the test and there were students in 2020 who did not take the, the test. So it was a longer growth window for students versus this past year was a true one year progress measure from the test that they took in 2022 to the test that they took in 2023 to look at their English proficiency rate. So what you see is while we've had some really positive gains at the elementary level, we are again, that's really demonstrating we're moving in a positive trajectory because we had gains even though it was a shorter window for really assessing students and that would be the, the normal window of one year. Um, 
Students' uh, growth proficiency, again, this was another factor that was changed um, based on the implications and impact of COVID-19 and the school closures, the gradual reopening. Um, the metrics for 2023, again, returned back to those uh, pre-COVID uh, scoring systems. So this was another variable. So. Uh, what these are really uh, coming together to show is that there's a lot of differences between the 2022 and 2022 and 2023 report cards. Um, and finally, one of the biggest differences for our, our middle schools was that um, social studies achievement was now included on the report card. This was the first year that that happened. So again, um, of course, we want to see growth in our schools, 100%. However, we also want to make sure that we're measuring comparable indicators. And so the past two years were just a little challenging to do that. Next slide, please. However, despite all of those challenges, we did have some highlights that we wanted to share with you. We did have 18 schools that increased by one star. Um, we had 23 schools that were in the 90th percentile or higher. Um, we do recognize we had 30 six schools that reduced by one star, and we are working very strategically with those schools to identify the areas where that may have happened. We did see that happen in several schools because of the chronic absenteeism. And again, while schools were making some progress with that, the indicators had changed. Um, we want to also highlight two of our schools, Eastern Tech and West Towson, that were identified in the 100th percentile based on their performance. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Nijinato said, the, um, one of the things that changed was chronic absenteeism. And so we are going to share with you some of the things we are doing to fast forward, as Dr. Rogers has charged us to do, related to the um, system's priorities. And so the first thing we want to do is make sure that we're employing proactive and responsive strategies. And so while we're doing that in many areas, we wanted to make it relevant to our presentation. And with that being said, um, I do want to highlight the fact that um, a team of um, a team of folks from the Department of School Safety and the Department of Social Emotional Support um, actually were able to provide to BC STAT, which is Baltimore County's um, STAT uh, meeting with the CE and others to really share some important data around chronic absenteeism. And so that attendance committee, um, which is led by our attendance liaison, um, our PPW coordinator, and a representation of the PPW team, we were all there to basically share this data, and we wanted to share it with you. Although there were changes made to the Maryland um, State Report Card, we are very excited to see that from um, last year, based on last year's data or previous year's data, we are seeing increases um, in terms of how our students are coming to school, which represents the, um, the blue area in terms of just low chronic absenteeism, and then it kind of moves up through the orange and, and the red. Now, this is not necessarily year over year data, but this is where we kind of stand um, now, and we are definitely seeing um, decreases there. I did want to highlight that year over year, though, from an elementary school standpoint, if we look at the elementary school level, we're at approximately um, down 12 percent in terms of chronic absenteeism, and that was January 11th, um, 2023 to January 11th, 2024. Middle school is down approximately 10 percent, and high school is right at 10 percent in terms of a decrease in chronic chronic absenteeism. Next slide, please. In addition, we're making sure that there is utility around strategies and we're utilizing strategies to increase um, our SSR rating. This is just a sample of um, a really collaborative project and work that has come together through, the, through DRAA and the Department of Schools. Um, it definitely is something that they actually thought about. Um, we often think about instructional leadership and how we're we supporting our schools from an instructional leadership standpoint. But we also know that we need the specialized technical assistant and we assistance. And we don't use the word technical very often in education, but we came to this understanding as we begin to conduct needs assessments around data literacy and the data analysis and protocols and all those things is that those of us who are not um, statisticians, we do need some sense of um, technical assistance. And so they've provided just that in this form. Um, we will be able to provide um, samples as we begin to use it. We're in the process of rolling it out um, with our principals. We had an opportunity to share it with them at our principals' leadership development. But what it essentially is, is it, it has the various indicators on the school report card. And then each school actually has what we're considering or calling a tool. And so it will show you. It shows the principal and the instructional leadership team exactly where they are um, over time 
I think it dates about three or, or so years back, where they've scored in each of the areas and some of the things that they can do to increase their scores. It is an interactive tool. We're able to click on it, and it takes you um, to a data display, which is in um, power and form. Again, we are in the process of rolling out this tool to really think about how we can provide that specialized um, teaching and learning, instructional leadership, and technical assistance to our schools. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. DiGenato. Thank you. As we continue to look to fast forward our achievement prioritizing our uh, English language arts, math, ESA, and special education, we wanted to highlight some of the things that we are doing and have in place in order to move this work forward. So as a school system, we are completely prioritizing these four areas to the point that principal leadership development on a monthly basis includes these four topic areas, as well as integration of other content areas within it. So for example, with ESA, what are the strategies and supports that we should be seeing in all of our classrooms for our multilingual learners? What are those coaching feedback tools and moves that administrators can make to support their teachers doing it? And then what would it look like within a social studies class? So giving them those practical application of what they can look for within classrooms so that they are giving feedback to teachers around specific content as well as specific strategies to support learners in our schools. Um, we are also conducting uh, principal leadership learning walks um, in elementary schools. So elementary schools each have two days in which an HMH coach comes to their schools, works with the school principal, collaborates with teachers, can provide very individualized support of, I can't find this, and what's a better way to find this tool, or if I want to find this resource, and we'll work with teachers individually as well as the school administrators. The HMH coaches go on walks with the school administrators, and then the follow-up are leadership walks with multiple principals um, at a single school with an HMH coach. For example, um, I know that Dr. Jones was at a school this afternoon. I was at a different school this morning with an HMH coach, as well as several other principals and other uh, staff from the office, of the division of schools, to walk through classrooms, look at instructional impl implications, um, level set, identify areas of need and growth, ask specific questions about things that we're seeing in the moment from the HMH coach to identify how we can then, one, shift professional development that may need to occur for either principals or for teachers, and we can then identify some next steps for that specific school. So in a follow-up visit, whether it's from their executive director of schools or from someone from the division of schools or with their HMH coach, they have another incremental step of what they can look at for implementation for HMH. We are also doing our cross-divisional collaborative instructional visits. So that's staff from curriculum instruction along with the division of schools going to schools to visit to look at instruction um, using the look for tools that we're supporting principals with during professional development, walking together with school administrators, again, creating that very consistent level setting of instructional expectations and really coaching principles around, you know, what, what did you see in the classroom? What kind of feedback would you give around that? What are the questions you may ask a teacher based on what we saw in the classroom? And then how can we move instruction forward from that point? Um, in addition, you saw in uh, the budget presentation the addition of um, ESA as well as special education teacher positions. In a time of teacher shortages, I know a lot of questions are, well, where are you going to find them? Um, one of the things that we are trying to do is support our own teachers in becoming dual certified. So we are providing uh, ESA and special education praxis cohorts for our teachers so that they can engage in professional development, learn more about the test, get some tips about uh, things, that, content that is really important on the assessment so that we're also looking at creating um, our own pool of dual, dual certified staff members who can help support their students. Because again, as we're improving everybody's pedagogy and knowledge of strategies, that's going to support and enhance the instruction of all of our kids. Next slide, please. All right, emphasizing uh, strategies to increase um, our uh, English language learners proficiency with English. Um, we do have a new director for multilingual achievement. As you heard Dr. Rogers uh, mention, she's working in the division of schools, so really working firsthand to look at the instructional implications in the classroom, working very collaboratively with the Office of Curriculum and Instruction to evaluate what's happening in our classes, look at what are the strategies that, again, that we're providing in professional development, how do we see those happening in schools, and for the decentralization of our ESAW centers, so that's the movement of our middle and high school students from the regional centers back to their neighborhood schools, what are the professional development um, 
needs of those schools and how are we making sure that we're providing to them them to them now so that those schools are well prepared for their students and we're not offering summer optional professional developments but rather those staff are going to be trained already um, let's see uh, ESOS whoop, go back please thank you um, ESOS school support visits I just spoke about that um, we provided a professional development again to our principals looking at um, what Dr. Jones was talking about increasing data literacy so helping our school administrators really understand um, the access for L's or the WIDA assessment and those scores. The WIDA assessment uh, scores and students' English proficiency increasing can earn up to 10 points on the ESSA report card. That's the equivalent to a graduation rate point value at the high school level, which means this is really important for our administrators to understand this assessment and to understand the different pathways that students demonstrate English proficiency, because there's two different metrics that can be used depending on how long a student has been receiving um, English language services within the United States. Um, I mentioned just before the SIOPS strategies for principals and professional development in school teams. So again, really looking at how can we front load professional development to all parts of our school staff from administrators to classroom teachers. Next slide. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. DiDonato and Dr. Jones. Any questions from the board? Yes, uh, Ms. Dominowski. Yes, um, thank you for all that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something. There's lots of good things in there, but one thing that definitely stood out to me was the middle school scores. Mm -hmm. um, 21 out of 27 got a two star or below. That's um, alarming to me. And I'm wondering, I'm, maybe Dr. Rogers can speak to this, what are we doing right now to effectively address that? Are we, is, I think some elementary schools have like a red light and green where quarterly or um, year, uh, uh, half yearly they mid-year they'll check in and see how their their students are doing so that they know where they need to catch up who needs more work i just that's a that's that what are we doing there <laughs> so i can say it's multifaceted so one one of the things that we're doing is the secondary reading interventions are happening in our schools as you know at the beginning of the year we came to you and we talked about some of our secondary middle and high schools were not scheduling students who needed reading intervention in reading intervention they're in it now Part of when we had asked for increased spending authority was so that we had in those tools to provide reading intervention. So one, we're working on making sure all of our kids are reading. We're also looking at our curriculum-based assessment. So after each unit assessment, the uh, school principals, as well as the executive directors from um, the Division of Schools, as well as DRAA and um, curriculum instruction are looking at what are those indicators that we're seeing. So it's not just a beginning of year, mid-year, but it's after every unit assessment. What are we seeing as far as areas where students are still struggling on certain standards? Are those standards that are addressed in other units? Because some of our curriculum is spiral. So you'll have a skill and indicator that you have in unit one, and then you see it resurface in unit three. And again, when we look at standards we want students to master, it's within a year. It's not within just like the first two months of school. So it's okay that we're going to do it again in uh, unit three because we still haven't gotten to the end of the year yet. So the goal is by the end of that unit, if it's not going to be revisited, that they've mastered it at that time. So we're looking at our curriculum-based assessments, and we are seeing prog positive progress on our curriculum-based assessments, mm -hmm. which is, again, a positive indicator for what we're doing. Looking at um, you know, what are we doing as far as professional development in classroom work, so our Office of Mathematics, that was an area of big need for us at the middle school level are visiting our middle schools, walking with school principals, walking them through illustrative math, what are the things that they should be looking for, what do they see in the classrooms, what feedback are we giving to teachers, and then having those follow-up visits to really see how have school administrators begun embracing giving some differentiated feedback so that we are really trying to move the quality of the instruction forward so that we will see those changes. And it's it's not just that, well, you know, how they're doing academically, but how they're doing, you know, emotionally or, or disciplinary-wise. Are, are you getting feedback from the teachers as far as, you know, are they 
is there something else that needs to be done there? I know we have the student safety assistance there. Is that working? Is that something we need more of? Um, I, I, just the atmosphere wise that's going on there. Do you want to guess? You, yes, yes, thank you. I, I, I thought I was done for the night, Ms. Dominowski. Um, but you know, what you raise is exactly our work. So we have a uh, central office instructional leadership team meeting mm -hmm. and we meet every uh, three weeks and we rotate the grade levels where we're reviewing the data. And so we start off with the academic data. We don't only look at report cards, so you know that's one measure, but we also look at these district assessments because they're directly aligned to the state assessment, um, and it gives us that objective view of how our students doing are doing and predictive, as well as it informs uh, curriculum and instruction's work in terms of if there's anything that they need to do quickly to get out um, to the schools. But the other piece of that meeting, in addition to going through all of the academics and the standards, and we compare performance performance from last year and whether or not we're making growth. We look at attendance, we look at suspensions, we look at behavior, any uh, infractions. For middle school, we've rolled out uh, those mental health services with uh, that pilot. We're looking at um, usage, uh, but you know we're looking at all of that data because we know it all has a role, including that's why we're looking at chronic absenteeism, because the first step is you need to be uh, in the buildings. And so middle school um, is another pain point for us, but it's an area that's receiving a lot of of um, attention um, and you know we're, we're going to continue to focus in that area and continue to you know monitor that data and and hopefully we're going to see the progress based on the investments uh, that we're providing and also the feedback the direct feedback that our principals are giving us on a regular basis thank you thank you any other questions miss harvey Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have uh, a couple of questions, brief and comments. Uh, the chronic absenteeism, and I, I'm not really expecting an answer tonight, but last year in the report for chronic absenteeism, uh, we were informed that there were patterns in that, that we could predict when kids were going to miss sections of school after the holidays or you know certain times of year. and just really wanting to know is is that consideration are you still receiving that type of data and is that consideration part of your strategy yes and yes yes there are predictable patterns um, i think what we're trying to do is disrupt some of those patterns and really create um, a sense of um, stronger meaning and i don't want to say value because I, I i believe as a parent myself that education is valued but a sense of understanding mm -hmm. if that makes sense around those patterns that can be interrupted and and changed based on the fact that our students need to be in school so to both of your answers yes and yes um, and you're right that data is not available um, this evening but that is something that we definitely drill down to to begin thinking about because that helps us provide differentiated supports to our um, students in a very um, diverse way, but then also to our schools um, as it relates to their needs. Thank you. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate a disciplined approach to the practice using your data and uh, a differentiated approach, recognizing mm -hmm. that schools may need different approaches at different schools. Yes. I also wanted to know, you mentioned that the coaches for the interreading uh, at the elementary level were in the schools two days, two days per week, two days per month, two days at what interval? So there were two visits during the first semester of the school year, and this was an additional uh, visit to the school despite other visits from central office or from their principal supervisors. So this was a first-hand opportunity for school principals to have someone just with them to look at specific nuances of curriculum implementation within their building from someone trained by the vendor. So they have other opportunities with us going in. They have other opportunities with their executive directors of schools. But this was just really focused with someone who is a content expert from the vendor so they could look through some nuances of curriculum implementation with them. Okay. And then we have 18 schools that increased by a star, which mm -hmm. means we're doing something right, right. something well. Mm -hmm. We have 36 schools that decreased by a star, which means we have some challenges that we still need to meet. Mm -hmm. Are you recognizing any patterns in those increases and decreases by school by region, by, are there any patterns that you've recognized? So again, I think there, yes, there are always patterns to me. I think, I think data lends itself 
um, to patterns. What, what we really believe is a pattern is what we talked about, some of the changes, some of the changes as it relates to um, our schools trying to achieve a moving target. But we do believe that this year we'll be able to create somewhat of, um, somewhat of a baseline. What we have done is begin to share what some of our principals are doing and what they're doing well. So we're highlighting in the midst of all of this, we're trying to highlight those best practices. What are some of the things that our schools are doing where there are increases or incremental change? And so during our professional development, we have principals share out. Um, we have them dialogue, we have them work very closely together and make sure that they are visiting each other's schools and tapping into what is what is working well. We are finding that in some of our schools that have um, you know had um, you know significant challenges as it relates to academic achievement, they are making incremental change, but it's not necessarily showing up in the in the data just yet, but we are excited about those incremental incremental changes that are occurring. We do have some outliers. We have some schools that are considered to be all of the things that you know we may may fit a profile where they're not necessarily considered to be doing well, but they are. But again, it's incremental changes, and we are celebrating every when we possibly get because we believe that with a steadfastness, we'll be able to jump to the next star in the next um, piece. Also working with our, um, our um, DOS or um, Department of Schools executive directors. It's not just, we often talk about schools, but we're also building our capacity. And we're building the capacity of the executive leaders to be able to coach efforts that require turnaround, to be able to coach efforts that require a different, a different approach. So it is, as we often say, multi-pronged, multi-faceted. But yes, there are patterns within the data. We are seeing that some of our schools that have been traditionally or um, you know, historically low performing making gains, they just haven't showed up in the data yet. But we are determined. We almost have a pledge and a chant we say every day <laughs> that we will get it right for students. So thank you for asking. Ms. Harvey, just to piggyback on what uh, Dr. Jones was speaking about, so one of the uh, strategies as far as looking at the SSR ratings and helping principals really dig into that in a different way, so there are certain point values on that that aren't necessarily about instructional things that are happening in the school, but they're about scheduling. So students' access to a well-rounded curriculum, that's a report that we pull from Focus. So if students um, aren't scheduled in fifth grade health for whatever reason, then that takes points away from that. So making sure that those very easy things, which is making sure we have accurate data and information about students, are one of the pieces that we're looking at. That should never be an area where our student, that we're, our, we have schools losing points. All of our students have science, social studies, and health at the elementary level. They're all getting their personal finance courses. They're, those are all things that are happening for students. So a scheduling anomaly should not be a reason why a school doesn't receive something receive their points for that. So part of helping principals really look strategically at their data and every single component of it is to make sure those little things are not creating bigger challenges that then create that point uh, variation where they don't, we don't see them moving up because the progress in their other areas aren't seen because of that. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, other questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Rampong. Um, so is this optional for schools to take? I was just looking at the numbers for the total and I see that it's 161 schools and I know that we have um, more schools than that. I'm sorry, can you let us know what you're mm -hmm. to? So on slide number five with the BCPS performance and you see the total and the star ratings, when you um, total up that last category for all five, um, it's like 160, 161 schools. Right. So, so our schools and um, yeah. our centers, like so, Catonsville Alternative Centers, Campfield. Campfield, like those are all. Well, Campfield score doesn't have scores because it only goes up to kindergarten, so they wouldn't have a report card. Right. But students who are attending um, Rosedale or um, VLP, their schools, their scores are routed back to their neighborhood zone school, and so that decreases the number of places, although those are part of our schools and centers, their scores go back to their neighborhood school. Yeah, that was a great question. Good question. 
And I have one question. So I think this was a great presentation. And I'm, you know, just kind of following up on what Ms. Harvey was talking about around chronic absenteeism. Do we know the root causes of why the students aren't coming to school? Or is there like a certain demographic of student that's not showing up? Or like are these the homeless students, migrant students? Um, do we know anything about the root causes as to why students aren't, are, are being, are chronically absent? I can start. Yeah. Um, I, and, and the start would be there so many different causes. Um, when we, you know, when we looked at um, our data, so we disaggregated the data by level, by zone, by student groups, uh, and we did that because we were having um, levels of, you know, chronic absenteeism across every group. So across every, you know, socioeconomic static, central, east, west, middle, high, elementary. Um, and so with that comes a variety of reasons. There are some that are based on hardship, um, but there are some, you know, the students want to sleep in. Um, you know, they're, they're, and there's everything in between. And so, um, we look for those reasons uh, where students and families are experiencing difficulty so we can provide those wraparound uh, supports. But on top of that, we've really been intentional about that here for it intended campaign to let everyone know the importance of regular school attendance. And even if, you know, sometimes you want to give uh, your, your young child or your older child, you know, a mental health break, you want to give them a day off, you can and still not be chronically absent. Mm -hmm. So part of that is educating, you know, our community on here's how many breaks you can take and still be <laughs> in the low area for you guys if you want to add. No, 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 I was going to say the same thing. There are multiple. There are multiple factors, and we are we are studying patterns to be able to provide those wraparound services and those additional supports. Um, I, I think that's kind of the key to study those patterns, but it's not just one thing. Oh, thanks. I was hoping it was an easy answer, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is information. The first item is the FY24 general fund report on revenues, expenditures, and encumbrances, budget and actual for the period ending November 2023. The last item is the revised superintendent's rule 5210. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. So first, our committee updates. And I would like to start with the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. We had a great meeting yesterday where we began to um, dive, take a deeper dive into our draft priorities. And so we are looking forward at coming back to the board meeting in February with draft priorities for the entire board to, to review and react to. Next, we'll have um, updates from, from uh, the Audit Committee. So we'll go to Mr. McMillian. I met with Ms. Barr recently, and we did our agenda for the last meeting. Um, that was here a couple, I think Tuesday or a week ago. So we don't have another meeting until February. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Budget Committee, Ms. Dominowski. Yes, our next meeting is this Thursday at 5.30. Thank you. Building and Contracts, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next building and contracts meeting is Monday, February 12th at 5 p.m. virtually. Please join us if you can. Thank you. Curriculum Committee, Ms. Lichter. Our next meeting is on Thursday, February 1st at 4.30, and one of the items on the agenda will be an update on the um, implementation of HMH in our elementary schools. So right. stay tuned for that. Um, Equity Committee, is Dr. Savoy on still? Our next meeting will be the first Thursday in February at 4 o'clock through Teams. Thank you. Thank you. And Policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. Um, we did not have a meeting in January, but our next meeting is scheduled for February 4th. And I also just wanted to mention that um, I will be discussing with Ms. Howley and staff a more intentional way to um, review our policies through an equity lens. I feel that we do that already, but I want to be more intentional about it. So we're going to have a discussion about that to make sure that um, that's being done throughout the Thank you. Next is agenda items. Board members, please raise your hand to indicate if you have any comments or items for consideration. Yes, Ms. Seleski. 
Yeah, so first of all, I just want to comment that there's so much um, intention in everything that seems to be changing within the school system, very purposeful change and efforts. Um, the only agenda item I have is, I know several months ago there was a request for an update on the pilot with the cell phone policy, um, so it would be great if we could um, have that update um, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other agenda requests? Okay, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held Tuesday, February 13th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.